welcome to episode six of Out of Your League, uh, the greatest podcast in the history of podcasts, some might have said. Uh, you can download it via Apple uh, Podcasts, of course, Podbean, Spotify, wherever you get them. Uh, watch us on YouTube as well. Get in touch at Super League on social media. Use the hashtag. A lot of information there, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Uh, at Super League on social media. Um, out of your league. Here we go again, Mark. We are with you until... After the grand final. After the grand final is the correct answer. I was coming up on the train this morning from London because I've moved down to London Have you? with my people. Um, Diane Abbott was sat opposite me. Labour MP. Labour MP. The first mm. black female MP. You ever. chat to her. I, I, I didn't chat to her. What did you say? She said a couple of words to me and it was, do you mind if I use that plug socket? <laughs> Uh, did she offer you a table. can of gin and tonic? We weren't in first class, by the way. We were just in, amongst the, the normal people. Yeah. Um, and she sort of read, she said, do you mind if I use that plug? She was reading a book called uh, Mum, Can You Lend Me 20 Quid? What Drugs Did to My Family. Pretty intense. Yeah. Um, right, we've got a bit of a cricket theme this week, Mark, because you might have heard that voice there if you're not watching and thought, hmm, who was that? Mm. Sounds, he, sounds, he sounds interesting. He sounds a little bit like sexual chocolate. <laughs> You think that, Mark? Yeah, I thought that. Yeah. Uh, we have brought in the man who goes by the name of Sexual Chocolate. 79 wickets and 22 tests for England. A T20 World Cup winner. He's got five county championship titles to his name as well at Yorkshire and Notts. Diane Abbott, eat your heart out. Welcome to Out of the League, Mr. Ryan Sidebottom. Thank you. It's great great to, to have you here. Um, I, I want you a little bit closer as well because you have got the greatest hair, not just in cricket, I think in, 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 the world. in the world. In the world. I think it's fair to say. Mark. In the world, I'll yeah. take that. I, 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 I'm going to have a touch later. Thank that, you. Mark, I'm, that I'm is, quite jealous. It's a lot thicker than mine. It is very thick. It, it is, it is the greatest. It certainly was. Certainly the greatest hair in, in cricket. Um, I'm just thinking of other people, Mark. Brian May. Um, Sideshow Bob. Sideshow Bob. Bob. Simpsons. David Luiz, Matteo Genduzzi at Luiz. Arsenal. You could, you could play for Arsenal now. Yeah, of course. There's you? a few in that you team. Valderrama. 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 Puyol. Carlos <laughs> Puyol, uh, Roger Sha- Daltrey, Shakira. It's going to Shakira. be good pod- podcast list for an hour just listening. To people. Uh, I'd, I'd put it at the top of, of that list. Um, mm-hmm. It's always been. Has it always been your thing? I think so. It's always been. I part mean, you've got other things we're going to talk yeah, about. Yeah, it's always been part of my personality, and I suppose growing up, I've always had long hair. So why would I change it? You know, I, I can't rather. imagine you without. It's like you came out the womb with yeah, that. Yeah, I'd look ridiculous, short back and sides, wouldn't I? <laughs> so I've got to have the long, frizzy, stupid curly hair. Have you ever tried it? Short back inside. No, but I once, I once got drunk on a Christmas party and my girlfriends at the time decided, why don't you straighten it? So I allowed them to yeah. and then I, was, I got called Frank Gallagher of Shameless. <laughs> Did you say girlfriends? Yeah, I think well, you said not that. Girlfriends Can you clear that one up? Friends. Friends with girls. Friends, yeah. oh, right. friends, friends with, with girls. girls, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Friends like in between us. <laughs> friends. <laughs> uh, Michael Bolton, another one who just came yeah, to right. Oh, right. He's, he's he got, yeah, now I can't be Michael Bolton. He was class, Michael Bolton. He was, wasn't he? I used to have Michael Bolton on tape back in the day. We listen to him in the gym sometimes at Salford, yeah. <laughs> Who was your first tape? My first tape. Your first tape. CD. Yeah. Um, Ta- no, tape. Tape, what about tape? Cassette? You're not that oh, young. Cassette, no, I'm, I'm yeah. too young for that. Oh, you're not. I am. Really? I had football, um, footballs coming home with the World Cup anthem. That was probably uh, the first one. Mine was uh, Stay. <laughs> See, everyone, always, everyone always tries to be cool with these, don't they? You've just got to be honest. Mine was, mine was Stay, E17. That's a good tune. It was a good tune. I actually yeah. really still like it. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Isn't it? I'm not fair. Yeah, you, know, you know what the one to ask? Yeah. Stay Did you want to sing it for us? Yeah. No. Stay now. Baby, if you got to go away. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, talk us through your, your, your hair routines. I'm, I'm semi obsessed mm. with I this. I don't have one. You don't have I one. I don't have one. When sexual, you get up in the morning, you yeah. don't do anything to it. No, nothing at all. Just leave it be. The sexual chocolate theme and nickname came from Darren Goff. <laughs> when I first started at Yorkshire, and made my debut, yeah. I used to have, it was like really long. I used to put loads of product in it. I looked totally ridiculous. I thought I looked cool. Um, and sexual chocolate is the band off coming to America. Eddie Murphy. With Eddie yeah, Murphy. Is, yeah. yeah. Um, and they had sort of greasy, shiny, the soul glow theme, wasn't it? <laughs> so, um, Goffy called me sexual chocolate, and then that nickname has it stuck? Stuck ever has since. Has it actually stuck? It has, yeah. yeah. I mean, everybody calls me Siddy, obviously, short for side bottom, but um, yeah, the sexual chocolate, everybody asks me, why sexual chocolate? <laughs> it, obviously, it's not any sexual connotation, but it's just the Eddie Murphy coming so, to America if, movie. If, if that was my nickname, yeah, I'd speak about myself in the third person and have sexual chocolate once a cup of tea. I'd introduce myself as yeah, sexual chocolate. Like, no, sexual great chocolate. name, great yeah. name for a horse yeah. or a pub. 
Yeah, isn't it? Well. Band. 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 Yeah. Band. Yeah. 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 Well, they, they, were Eddie, Eddie they weren't very good, were they? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't very good. Um, but uh, no, uh, you're thinking, why am I still talking about your hair? Because you know, I think we do have to spend a little bit of time. And so, is there is there a routine to it? You're saying you do nothing nah. to it whatsoever. So you, you might do. You, do you run your hands through no, it? No, I don't. Morning, I literally, literally just leave, leave it be. I don't, I've no... Mark's no, gone in there and touched it. Right. Mark's gone in there and touched it. I was going to ask a commission, uh, but you just went straight in and touched it. I'm just what I'm doing. I'm getting a bit <laughs> of a <laughs> <pumped laughs> on my little gut. A few snakes here, in there, but... <laughs> but uh, do, do you have a, a metrosexual sort of toilet bag routine in the morning? Yeah, I, always, I brought it with me, actually. Yeah, it's quite embarrassing, but I don't have a routine. No. Leave it be, let it let it do its thing. Shamp shampoo condition? Shampoo, yeah. I'm going to paint a new shampoo, La Poodle. But it hasn't just come, it hasn't come out yet. But I will do it at some stage. <laughs> the, because you shouldn't shampoo and condition too much, Mark. That's what they're saying. You know, oh, a little yeah. bit of a little bit of oil in there, maybe you know, shampoo once a week, something like that. Um, Good to know. By the way, we did, we did we were going to try and throw Johnny Bairstow in this little group as well, but he's in Manchester. We tried our best to get him because I know you're very good mates with him. He's as in well, Manchester right? and he couldn't be bothered. He's, he's basically yeah. about 800 metres away from us yeah. and he doesn't have time for us. And we're we all supposedly friends with him. We with him. The wanky messages, didn't we? We did. Some, some are better friends. I mean, you're yeah. very good friends. One of your kids, he's godfather to one of your he's kids. He's godfather to my son, Dali. So he's, um, he's been part of my family since growing up. Uh, my father and his father uh, played for Yorkshire for mm -hmm. many, many years. Um, so yeah, he's part of the family history and yeah, I look with fondness and, and proudness at what he's done with his career, what he's doing now, and mm. yeah, it's great. So yeah, we've all got to have one ginger mate, haven't we? I guess yeah, we're one mm. rogue ginger, aren't we? So, yeah. but he, he uh, we Mark even offered to buy him some new wicketkeeper gloves. I said we'll get him a bat. I gave him a selection of bats we uh -huh. could get for him, and, and said Mark would knock it in for him, or John Mark, Mark Wilkin might knock it in for him. Still, so nothing. Not interested whatsoever. Um, you mentioned your dad there. Your dad played for Manchester United. He did, as well as obviously England. He played a test for England, didn't he? But uh -huh. Yorkshire legend. Manchester United, Huddersfield, back in back in the day. Back in the day, yeah. Was that Dennis to, Law days, wasn't it? Yeah, Dennis Law, George Best, Charlton. Was uh, he in that team with them? He was. Yeah, he signed as a nineteen-year-old from Barnsley Schoolboys. I think he was there three seasons. I don't. I think he played maybe thirty or thirty odd games, twenty odd games. Mm. But yeah, he doesn't. He, he's quite um, a humble man. He doesn't really sort of say, "Oh, I've, I've done this, I've done that." But when he's had a few whiskey and lemonades <laughs> down him, he he sort of says, "Oh, you know." Bobby Charlton, played with Bobby Charlton and George Best, and yeah, um, I bet so he had some, quite... nights, some nights out with them, didn't he? Yeah, I think he. George Best had like a secret, not so secret now. House yeah, in... Dad sort of says a story that George Best used to go missing, and it was like Miss World, Miss Universe. <laughs> um, so he was quite a popular man um, in the dressing room and away from the dressing room. But yeah. he, yeah, he he doesn't say very much about what he's done in his career in terms of playing football, but. He said he was pretty crap, to be honest. He went, oh, I just used to kick him and hoof it out. He was a defender, touch. wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. And he had the long hair as well. He's got no hair yeah, now, yeah, but yeah. he had the long, flowing that, 70s. I mean, to, to be fair, in the 70s, with George, you just want to get in George Best's slipstream, don't you? And just follow him wherever you go. Any, yeah. any night out, just sit behind him, yeah, tailgate said, him. You know what? He said he was absolutely amazing. He said he didn't, he didn't change with the first team. He used to get changed with the academy. Mm. He said he was brilliant for the young kids that were making their way in, in the game and in the dressing room. He said he was just a fantastic bloke on and off, you know, on and off the pitch. So, mm. you know, he, he would always speak highly of George Best and what he, what he did. And he said, he, he said, in today's money, what would he be worth? He was mm. that awesome. He was that good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but that used to be a thing, didn't it? In the sort of back 70s and before 60s of players who were clearly multi-talented and could play sport at the top level and would play professional football and professional cricket or whatever it be, rugby at the same time. Yeah. You, know, you couldn't do it now, could you? No, you, I mean, you could not do it now at all. I was especially, I suppose, with the money that's in, in football and, um, you know... The contracts. Yeah, the contracts <laughs> and what you have to do and... Um, but yeah, he he was probably one of the last that was allowed to do, you know, played both. But mm. He said he had to choose at one stage of his career what he was going to do, whether it was going to be football and cricket, and he, he went down the cricket. You had to make the same choice, didn't you? Sheffield United? Sheffield United, yeah. I was at Sheffield United for a bit. I was at Huddersfield Schoolboys and um, had various trials here, there and everywhere. But you know what? I was never going to be good enough. My dad was pretty blunt. Barnsley lad says it how it is, and he, he went, look, you're a bit of a donkey, you've got a nice left foot, but you're never going to make it a footy, so you should concentrate <laughs> on cricket, so there you have it. You, see, you two have got a, uh, quite a bit in common in the sense that you both had dads who were playing at the top yeah. level. Mark's dad, rugby league legend, yeah. is Terry, 
Um, was, I guess there was a bit of pressure on both of you, wasn't there, from a young age yeah, to, no, to do something? No, you couldn't be a complete failure, could you? I don't, well, could have been, yeah. Um, still time for that. Still you have that nepotism, like at school, did everyone say, oh, yeah, that's, that's Terry, he's only, oh, he's only there because of his... Yeah, mom. a bit. <laughs> when, I, when I played local rugby in, like, for started with our water at the local rivalry, I yeah. knew that everyone knew I was his son. But, yeah, there was no pressure from him. He wasn't. He just wanted me to be happy. So he used to take me to football instead of rugby quite a bit because... You know, I used to love football, but probably like yourself, wasn't mm. wasn't quite good enough. But just, the, I just wanted to prove everyone wrong and, and prove myself as a player rather than just living in his shadow my whole career, um, which I think I've done. But I'm still proud to be, you know, associated with him. And a lot of my family played. My uncles, my granddads, my cousins all played like local. But, local but then, that, but then by that, word, there was not direct pressure from him or from your family. But that in itself is the pressure. Yeah, the, isn't the it? pressure was intrinsic. It was in, inside me that I put on myself wanting to prove everybody that I could do it. And that, I think sometimes that's a bigger pressure than anybody else can put on you. If, it's, if it burns inside you, then you can never get away from it, really. And it's mm. probably what spurred me on to do all right in my career. Did you have that with, with Arnie? A little bit, yeah. There's always that sort of the, knowing what your dad had achieved and you want to follow in his footsteps and try and become maybe better than him. Um, but he, yeah, as a young lad, I got it a little bit like, oh, that's Arnie's son and he's only here because of his dad and blah, blah, blah. But... What I will say about that, it sort of made me more determined yeah. to thought, you know what, stick two fingers up at those people. Like, you know what, I'll prove you wrong. I'll, I'll show I'm going to make it and, and do well in my career. But I, same as Mark, I never, I never sort of thought, oh, God, I put pressure on myself because of my dad. Mm. It was more outwardly. Yeah, yeah. Are you, what about rugby league then? You actually, I mean, you, you were born in around Huddersfield, weren't Huddersfield, you? Huddersfield, yeah, Huddersfield so area. Did you, did you grow up a rugby? Had, well, the, I guess what the question I'm getting to is, had you heard of Mark Flanagan before today? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yes. That's good, isn't it? He's a fantastic like his player. Eyes, his eyes have lit well, up. Well, you know what? Yeah, because I'm a, my number one love is rugby league. My dad's number one love was really? rugby league. Really? Number one love is rugby league? I absolutely love the sport. I mean, you know, these guys, what they do, you know, the heroes of mine, they put, you know, the bodies on the line. It's a great sport. Mm. And I grew up watching it. You know, my dad used to take me everywhere. My first game was Bradford, but the mighty Bradford Bulls. And they're your team, aren't they? They're my team. Yeah. Yeah. They're not doing great now, I mean, are they? And I mean, they were great back in the day, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, they were absolutely awesome. And the Volcano was my my favourite player, mm. Leslie Vinacolo. So, so your but your early memories are on the terraces with your dad watching. Yeah, Brad. dad used to take me. I remember, um, you know, he used to, eat, you know, playing at Yorkshire. He knew Gary Schofield, and he used to you know, have a few drinks with the rugby, you know, rhinos lads in, in not at the time, um, you know, down in town. He used to shove me in the corner with Pop and Chris and he'd have a few drinks with the mm. rugby league players. But yeah, my first game was Bradford, Bradford Northern. Um, Roy Powell was a forward, right. I think, played for Bradford Northern at the time. And I just remember sitting in the players' lounge and seeing these massive guys all walking. I was like, Dad, who's that? Dad, who's that? And I was just hooked. But you say that now, you're six foot four and you weigh 95 kilograms. You, you, you'd kick the shit out of Mark. I doubt uh, it. <laughs> I'd, I'd run the other way. Don't forget, I'm a cricketer. He's a big lad, Mark, isn't he? He'd definitely kick the shit out of you, He Mark. would kick the shit out of me. I'm a cricketer, I'd run the other way. When it's raining, don't forget we run off and have cucumber sandwiches. So. For those who aren't watching, or I mean, who are watching, we sat down. He, he's a big boy, Mark, isn't he? He's a big he's boy. He's a big yeah. old boy. Yeah. I never, I've never, never quite realised how much of a unit side bottom Well, fast bottles usually are, aren't they? Yeah, the, a lot of people say to me, oh, well, you, Jimmy's, Jimmy's... So whip it, isn't he? He's still six. He's still six. Yeah, but he's, he's still he's a decent size. Ten stone, piss wet through. Yeah, I think generally bowlers are quite big lads, and everybody says, "Oh, you're a lot bigger than in real life than you are on a TV," because they're all they're all absolutely massive. Mm. Like bowlers are all really tall and quite, you know, fairly stocky. So, mm. what, what are we going to get onto? Um, uh, sort of life after cricket and everything else you've been doing. Mm -hmm. so you're even taller when you put your ice skates on, aren't you? We'll get, we'll get to dancing yeah, on ice. Yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a time to be a cricket fan. Uh, and I mean, even, even if you're not a cricket fan, then why aren't you? What a time to be alive after a summer like that with the World Cup. Y you won the, the T20 World Cup back in, in 2010. Mm -hmm. was, that, was that a life-changing moment for you guys, not individually, but as a, as a collective, for having... Done, achieve something like that? I think so, in terms of the growth of the game and for cricket, you know, winning a global tournament where England probably hist historically had not done that well in big tournaments. You know, we probably fought, it was 40 years before they'd won anything or I can't remember what it was. Mm. Um, but yeah, to go and win a big tournament like that when no one really gave us any chance um, was, yeah, obviously 
part of history. It was a great feeling. Did you? Have, uh, I've forgotten. Did you have the whole kind of going to the PM and all that sort of stuff? No, we didn't actually. No, no didn't it was it very wasn't big. It was very. I think because T20 had sort of around that time, you know, you had the IPL and the big bash. Mm. So it wasn't. T20 was still viewed as. You know, you want to test cricket, then 50 over, and then T20 was like, oh yeah, but England, you know, winning a global tournament was something really special, and we had a, you know, had a great team as well. Mm. I mean, this summer, Mark, isn't it? It's been one of those moments of everyone is going to remember for the rest of their life probably where they were yeah. during that. It was first, firstly, the World Cup moment, yeah. obviously we've had the Ashes one since, but what, what a moment. Yeah, I remember watching it with my dad, and my dad's a sports fan, but not necessarily a cricket fan, and it was a point when they needed. 20 odd runs from 12 balls and he was like they'll never get this and it was the odds were so stacked against them mm -hmm. and then you couldn't script the way they were going to get those runs as well with the the six off um stokes when he died for the the, the line and yeah. it bounced off his bat those little should moments have counted, should it? <laughs> we did though. Well, it should have been five but yeah. Yeah. i mean the rules say it should have been five yeah. but i mean you know yourself, Mark, and, you know, you need a little bit of luck, don't yeah, of you? Of course you do. In games, you need a bit of a, like, a knock-on or a forward pass, and then And we're so apologetic changes. about winning with a bit of luck, I find, yeah. the British culture. Still like, if, if that was an Australian team that had won that way, they wouldn't give two shits, but mm. we're kind of apologising for winning, not by the rules. Well, we, you just need to take the luck that it comes, it comes with it. It's part yeah. of sport. It's a beautiful sport, isn't it? You know, the yeah, entertainment, yeah. the drama, and... England, you know, were firm favourites and they probably they deservedly won the World Cup because they were the best team. Yeah. In, in terms of a game of, that brings people from all walks of life together, I can't really think of one better than, than cricket in terms of classes that brings any kind of social gathering together yeah, I think than, it, than, than different sports. Well, I think everything, you know, with religion and, you know, it's, it's played all around the world, you know, in, in most countries. And, but yeah, I think it's nice on home soil to win a global tournament because, again, you want people taking up the sport regardless. I think we, we spoke earlier saying it's not just about wanting people to play cricket. It's just watching the sport, enjoying a good game of cricket. Yeah. You know, because I, you know, I love cricket, but I, I prefer rugby league, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I prefer yeah. to watch rugby league. But yeah, it's great for, for cricket supporters and people that maybe didn't watch cricket but saw that final and would mm. say, oh, I'll go watch cricket next week or mm. I'll just go down to my local club because I enjoyed that game so much that I'm going to watch it again. But, but I mean, you know, guess in terms of the actual sport itself, like rugby union, everyone really associates sort of middle class, privately educated mm -hmm. guys. People like you? Potentially. Yeah. Um, uh, rugby league is more of, oh, let's Not go. Not now as a southerner. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know what I am anymore. Losing my bad. <laughs> but, you know, it, but with cricket, you've kind of got everyone together amongst those 11 guys, haven't you? Did you, did you feel that when you were getting into it? Because you must have, you know, you, you've been a good old Yorkshire boy yourself, you would, yeah. have, you would have met the, oh, the Middlesex and the, the Harrow and the Eton boys in your time as well. Yeah, you, you mix with all, all backgrounds, religions, colour, creed, it just, I think sport brings so many different personalities together. Mm. You know, regardless of where you're from, it doesn't matter or what you've done, you know, you're in a team, you stick together, you look after one another. I think that's the beauty of sport. Mm. I mean, Mark, it's hard to forget, isn't it, that um, he, this guy was a phenomenal bowler. Mm. Uh, and uh, what, you're over a thousand wickets in, in all yeah, formats? Yeah, I think, I think something, like, something like that. One, you, well, I know the number, just... 1,053. Oh, was it? Oh, God, I want to know myself. That man over there. But, but, <laughs> but, but what I want to get back to is that the moment when you, um, you, you you'd obviously come on the scene at, at Yorkshire, uh, and you got your England debut in 2001. So that, I want to get inside the, the feeling of you being called up to play for England and you're thinking probably, I'm putting words in your mouth, but this is the beginning of something beautiful here in 2001. Mm -hmm. And you made your, your test debut against Pakistan, was it? Yeah. And then you had this, this gap, this barren spell of six years before you came back into that, that England team. What were your memories back then? Yeah, at the time I was, I was still quite young and inexperienced. You know, I, pl I'd, I wasn't playing regular for Yorkshire. It was that winter previously that I um, did well on an England Day tour in the West Indies and I, I think I was leading wicket taker. And I came back during that summer and then I was just picked by England for the first test at Lords against, I think it was first test, against Pakistan. Quite inexperienced, still quite young and raw and not really knowing my game inside out. And yeah, it was, it was a pretty terrible debut really, if I'm being honest. You know, I didn't take a wicket. Um, my, the nerves probably got the better of me. Um, I've probably not experienced playing in big games in front of big crowds on a regular basis where you, you know you get accustomed to when you 
So yeah, it was it was quite tough. But did you feel that magnifying glass on you though? Yeah, uh, yeah of course yeah. you do. Yeah, most definitely. Um, probably not so much then. I mean, there's more social media and more press around around now. But at the time, yeah, I felt a lot of added pressure. You know, who I was, my dad, the history, playing for Yorkshire. But I think it was just it was just a great experience in terms of my dad, probably like Mark's dad, w was open and honest. He would tell me how it was, and he said, "Look, you." You probably w you weren't good enough. You probably weren't good enough to get selected during that test match. But you go away, you learn. Um, how can you get better as a player? Um, so I, I sort of took that on board from my father and went away and worked hard, got fitter, got stronger. And yeah, I know it was six years, but it it didn't seem like that. Mm. But then when you come back, you're more experienced. I played a lot of games. I played in front of big crowds, so I knew what I needed to do. Um, it wasn't, it was like just another game. You know, I didn't see it as like, oh, I'm playing for England. Oh God, like, what am I going to do? Mm. It was just like another game for me that go out there and do what I'd done. That's interesting that from your dad though, isn't it? Saying that you weren't good enough. I mean, I know well, that, sometimes I know, I know you that's need a really great advice. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, he, he watched, he was there, he watched the game and he, he you know what? He was open and honest. He, he wasn't doing it to, to upset me. He was just, he said, you're probably not good enough yet. You will be maybe down the line, but this is what you need to do. You need to work harder. And look, you take it on board. You, at the time, you, you don't like to hear it. You probably want to hear like all, you know, hunky-dory and you want your dad to mollycoddle you and go, oh yeah, you did great. But actually he was honest. He said, you didn't play well enough. That's probably why you're going to get dropped for the next game. This is what you need to do. And, and, and ath athletes of all sports always have adversity and the best ones always overcome it, whether it's the next match or the tour after that, or whether it's five or six years mm -hmm. like yourself. And it's just learning from those things, especially when you've come onto the scene young, and there's a lot of probably people that make a, a young debut and then it doesn't go well, and then they respond in the wrong way to that adversity, and it goes the other way, don't they? Yeah, and I think that was that was just it. You go back to county cricket, you you learn your trade, you, you play more games, you get more experienced, and you, you start to know your own game and how you know what you need to do to prepare, and and that was that was it basically. But yeah, I think it's it's a great story, isn't it, in terms of sport, how adversity or you know you have the ups and downs that you you need to come through to to improve as a as a player. Mm. There's no way you would have thought it would have been that long though. You must have been itching to get back and yeah, and ma massively, testing, yeah. massively. And it was it was quite weird because I was at Nottinghamshire at the time, and I got the call up, and it was it was going back to Headingley and playing my second test, so mm. it was. It was quite a, a nice <laughs> moment, which in a way is quite weird how it all panned out. I know, I know you've talked about this quite a lot, and I, I find this an interesting topic of, in sport in general, not just in cricket, those who are consistent are often overlooked to those who perhaps can perform and be incredible in one every ten games, and they're considered the ones to have the talent. Sometimes the best players are taken for granted. I see this in rugby league. Over the last 15 years... Probably James Robe has been one of the top three players every year. He's unbelievable, but people take it for granted because he's so good. That's his level. He's nine out of ten every game. Mm. He's probably missed out on some of the accolades that I think he deserves because it's expected. I'm sure it's the same in cricket. When mm -hmm. If you're always at that consistent level, it, people don't notice it as much. And yeah, that's probably what you're alluding to there. Well, that's, I mean, that was you, yeah. wasn't it, for a large period of time? And, you know, when you yeah, every, every year I was always sort of in and around, you know, top of the averages for, for the count, for every county and you know, I was always consistent, I always sort of took wickets in in each each format. But yeah, I think yeah, you Mark's totally right. I mean look at James Roby, what a what a great player he is. But yeah, yeah I think sometimes consistent consistency is overlooked because you when that person's doing the job regular, you look at you probably don't see it, do you? Yeah, it's just it's just there. It's the, it's the constant. But did you feel you weren't getting recognised for the performances you, you were putting in? Well, you don't you don't look at it like that. You just you go out every day, uh, every game, and try and just do your best and try and contribute to the team winning. You don't sort of say to yourself, "Oh God, like I did really well, but I'm going to get overlooked or I should I should be selected." Because if you start once you start doing that, you forget about what you're actually doing out on the pitch. Yeah, what, one of the one of the great moments I remember watching as well was um, New Zealand, 2008, mm -hmm. Hamilton, hat trick. Yeah, I mean, test hat tricks or uh, it's sort of these days a hat trick in the one day game is something, but a test hat trick is is something else, isn't it? What, what, what memories of that? And what have you done with the ball, more importantly? Where's yeah, that? I've, still got, I've still got the ball. Yeah. Dad, my mum and dad were there, actually. Again, dad never really watched me play. He was an absolute nervous wreck. 
And I always knew I had sort of, when I had a bad game, because I'd come home and my mum goes, oh, you all right, what's the matter? And I, she says, oh, your dad's been swearing at the television today. <laughs> so I knew I'd had, well, my mum, he knew I'd had a bad game and I knew I had a bad game. But yeah, it, it was a special moment because my parents were there. They travelled all the way to New Zealand. Again, it's, you know, it doesn't happen very often, you know, mm. to take a hat-trick, especially in test cricket. Yeah. And then in front of the Barmy Army fans, there was probably thousands of them watching and they were going mental and yeah, it was just just a nice feeling and, and a special moment. Have you, ever t- have you taken the ball out for a ride since? Nah, the ball's... No. What do you do with things like that? Where, well, I don't know, that's hidden it. away somewhere. in a cardboard box somewhere <laughs> at home. That's you don't, it's weird because you don't, you know, when you win trophies and stuff, you don't, it, it's nice, but I think the memories you always cherish is being with your teammates and yeah. the wins and losses. You know, of course it's nice to win trophies, but for me, is being around in a team of Ryman and yeah, it's the memories that from the day yeah. and the feeling that you give other people. That's what's that's what's great. Mm-hmm. I've got a grand final ring that I'd, somewhere in my house. You're going to melt it down, weren't you? I was going to melt it down and use it for a wedding ring. Actually, mm-hmm. take but it to the well. The shop. There's a shop on Dean's Gate. Cash for gold or something. Yeah, just, yes, flog it to them. For. But it's just it, it represents what you did and achieved. But that's not what gets you going, is it? Well, well, it's, 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 it depends how vain you are, doesn't it? At yeah. the same time, yeah, I think so. But I think. <laughs> Mike probably say the same. It's in your, it's in your memory. You've got it there forever, and you, it's what you've achieved with your mates that yeah. you, what you have to go through to win. Yeah. You know, win something special. And I say it depends how vain you are. This isn't a direct link to Tim Sherwood, who I was with this week. But Tim's Premier League winning medal, Blackburn it, 95, 96, no, as good as is is uh, encased in his uh, swimming pool. The bottom of his swimming pool, he's got this kind of this tile, where the where the medal is. <laughs> He's that's really he's weird. behind a little glass thing <laughs> at the bottom. That's, so just, that's just showing off. <laughs> that's, that's what I'd be doing. I'd be sticking them everywhere. Um, sledging. I want to talk about sledging because in cricket, it's it, it, it's completely different, isn't it, to any other sport? Sledging. And you probably get what's the equivalent of sledging in rugby league? We're still sledging. Just... What do you get? What, what's sort of anything funny? Anything? That, any sledging memories? Anything no, that's I don't, don't really made you laugh at the anymore. time? Wilkins, Wilkins to, your best one for that. Is he? Yeah. I can imagine he's an absolute. He sledges people and then gets knocked out. I think. <laughs> you, you knocked him out. Yeah, it was an accident. We talked about that. Key like, Senior knocked him talked out. Talked about that last week. Key Senior knocked him out. Yeah. We think a few people have liked... God, Key Senior. Yeah. Has been knocked out by Key Senior. Yeah. Um, but, but sledging in cricket, because obviously from your from a bowler's point of view, and then when you're coming in at 10 or 11, <laughs> trying to hold the fort, um, two very different types of sledging <laughs> that you've given and received. You know what? Again, I've probably not... I've never really sledged that much. Have you not? And I never got that much abuse either. So I didn't... I wasn't big because on you sledging. Didn't, because you didn't give it out, you didn't get much back. Yeah, and, and also I think I prefer to try and get them out rather than sledge because sometimes, if you, probably as Mark said, like John Wilkin, if you sledge someone then you get knocked out, it's like almost... Well, he says that. It's says, like mother rugby or mother yeah. cricket, isn't it? Yeah, so you deserve it. I've seen a lot of that players... That won't stop that, him though, will it? It'll go again. I think it's stopped now. <laughs> I think players that sledge generally, then they go non for 100 or they get smacked all over or yeah. they get, mm-hmm. you know... They, get out for a duck but does it work so, can you can you get in someone's head at the, like people trying to sledge steve smith for example you know trying anything just to get this guy out well i think sometimes it has it can have an adverse effect can't you? you you sledge that player and it just makes them more determined to go you know what two fingers at you i'm going to stay i'm going to hang around i'm going to stay in, i'm going to frustrate you and annoy you so i tend to not to because mm. it always sort of bit you in the backside if, yeah. if you did sledge who were the big sledges in that england team well, Swanee, Swanee was a brilliant sledger, but he would he'd find every little bit of information on social <laughs> media or in the paper. It doesn't surprise me So it was me like that all. sort of cheeky sledge where you would the batsman he would make the batsman laugh, so they'd mm. sort of not concentrate. So he was really good at that, not sledging, but knowing they might have gone out, you know, the night before and yeah. you know got off with someone or you know had a, had a few too many pints, and yeah. he'd he'd make sure he'd say, "Oh, how are you this morning? You hung over and." So he'd sort of, they'd sort of forget what they were doing. So he'd sort of make them laugh. I, I imagine he was a real sort of slow sledger as well. Like it would start, it would just build up slowly yeah, and slowly. And just, it wouldn't all be at once, of, at, you yeah, know, one over. sort of just keep going. Like he might have a, like, just say something, walking past the batter, yeah. and then he'd wait a few overs, then say something else. And he'd certainly get under the skin yeah, yeah. By, by doing so. But, but I guess in cricket, the, the reason why it is so successful is because you're out there for so long, especially in the test format. You're out there for so long. So anything to gain those marginal 
advantages. And, well, and clearly it's worked are, over the years, hasn't it? I think it? players are just bored because if they're out there <laughs> all day, they've probably just had enough, so they want a bit of entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, it, for example, you probably get it back from the crowd as well. I'm just thinking of times where you've been on the ropes and fielding and so on. It must have been bits where you've heard... Oh, I've been abused. And you've, from... and you've pissed yourself or other bits maybe that have crossed the line or what? Yeah, well, generally, obviously, I, I was always fielding down at fine leg, being a bowl, you bowl you over, you go down to fine leg you're probably the worst fielder where the ball's not going to come to you very often. So you can hear everything pretty much. And, you know, it was always either Spider-Man or Banana Man that would give me some stick. Or you'd just, you'd always hear one voice. There might be a, tw a group of 20 lads, but there'd always be one that you could hear. And it'd just be like some 50-year-old some big 24-stone guy with his belly hanging out. And you could, he'd give you some stick. But I generally didn't get that much. It no. was more with my hair, like, Gypsy or where's your caravan or go get your hair cut, <laughs> Frank Gallagher, so yeah. But there, but there must have been those times where you're desperately trying not to turn around, you're like, can't, got to set, and you just want to see who is giving you that stuff. Yeah, I would always try and have a look, see who it is, but <laughs> as a young lad, I didn't really like it. Yeah. I, I couldn't get used to it, but I, as I got older, I sort of thought, well, just join in with them. You know, if someone's eating a sausage on the boundary, I'd nick it and have a yeah. bite of it or nick a few chips or just join in with the crowd because you... Once you get them on your side, yeah. you, you've sort of got them then. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Even if you've had a bad game, they go, oh, see you later, and well tried, and blah, blah, blah. But it's part and parcel, isn't it? But you, but you went from probably a bit of an introvert, didn't you, as a youngster, to, to yeah, a bit of a joker in, over a 15-year career. Well, I had no option, because you know, I used to you know, be the butt of everybody's jokes with the hair. And, you know, I'm sorry, when we started, we started the podcast like that, exactly. we? we just yeah, walked, we walked into the stereotype. That, yeah. But yeah, I think going in a dressing room full of senior players, I mean, you know, they'd nick my wash bag, you know, my car was put on bricks. They'd just totally Your car take... was put on bricks? Yeah. I, it was like end of a day's play. I'd had a terrible day. I'd, I'd bowled absolutely horrendously bad and went to my car and it was on bricks. The senior players had put my car on bricks. I was That's there. That's a fair effort though, isn't it? Four, four yeah. tyres on How does that, I've never had my car put on bricks. Can you not just drive off the bricks? No, they just jack it up, take they the tyres off. They just jack it up, take the tyres off. Oh, they take the tyres off as well, right? On, I thought you just drove it onto bricks. It's on no, bricks, no. so I, as a young lad, I didn't <laughs> oh, have a clue. Oh, how very didn't, harrow. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have a clue what so I was doing. <laughs> who was right, the they took the that? wheels off. Took the wheels off. <laughs> who was the, who in charge of that one? I don't, I don't know. Still don't know to this day. Not got That's an expensive joke, really, isn't it? Expensive joke. Especially when you've had a shambolic day bowling. Yeah. You can make your car on bricks. You get someone like, in the dressing room, there was... He was labelled Jack the Snipper. He would go around snipping <laughs> underpants and Only socks. In Yorkshire. And you'd have a you'd have a long day. You'd turn up. You'd just have a shower. You want to go home, grab a bit of food. I'll go for a couple of pints with the lads, and you put your underpants on, <laughs> and you you're meeting two veggies hanging out because it, it's been snipped right across. You've no socks. Your laces are off your shoes. Just, just <laughs> on a snipper. You, 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 Jack you, the snipper. You, you're playing the sort of uh, the victim here with the car on bricks. I'm, I'm sure I remember reading at some stage that you put someone's car on bricks. Yeah, I've done that too. You got, so you got them back. I got, got the them. idea. Yeah, it was our... They uh, gave you the idea, they put the idea in your head and then you yeah, went, do you know it what? was our physio <laughs> at Knott's. He was a South African, didn't really get the banter. Um, so, <laughs> typical of South Africans, I suppose, isn't it? The, um, yeah, he just, um, he nicked my wash bag, which was a huge mistake because I had like my aftershaves and moisturiser in there and yeah. I thought, you know what, I'm not having that. I'm going to put his car on bricks and... Mm. It, That's it, the it, best it, way of dealing with it, over the top aggression. <laughs> so if someone does a little bit of something bad, you go straight yeah. 10 times worse and then that just ends then, it. Then you'll never get touched yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually alluding to Key Senior, funny story, we were having a team meeting in the dressing room and we sort of shared the dressing room rhinos and, um, you know, the Yorkshire lads. Mm. And we had this big meeting and it was like we'd lost and we were go like the coach was going off. Key Senior just walked in and went and had a, had a number two. <laughs> and you could hear everything and he didn't care, he just walked straight back out. And one of the lads said, Keith, we're just having a meeting. He went, yeah, I've had bigger shits than you, young man. And just walked straight out. So that was it. That was it. meeting Keith Senior for the first time. <laughs> but let, let's talk about hanging up your boots. Do you actually do that? Do you, you know, when you, when you retire from cricket, do you go and hang some boots up somewhere? No. Or do you, do you, um, what do you do? Have to put your, you have to put your ball away or something? Put your you know? box on a peg. Yeah, put your go, box on Go it. in that safe, put the code and just put your ball away for one final time. Yeah. What was, what, was that, what was that moment like when you... Was that a conversation with your dad as well? About when it was time to give it, give it up? Yeah, I think quiz? you... I suppose you have conversations with your family, but in your head, you... You know, the last two or three years, you know, I still love playing, I love competing, but I knew that I was coming towards the end. I was getting picking up a lot of niggles, a lot of injuries. Mm. 
So yeah, you, you know, I think uh, back in the 2017, I told the boys at the start of the year, we'd just won previously two champos and I thought, you know, this might give the lads a bit of a, you know, something else to sort of focus on. Mm. Ryan's retiring, let's go out there, let's, let's try and win another trophy. But yeah, it was just, it was a nice moment. You know, the boys, we did the Otley run mm. in Leeds afterwards and they dressed up as me. There was like 21 Ryan Sidebottoms, <laughs> all they all had different colour wigs on, all in the whites and yeah, it was quite You're big into your fancy dress, aren't you, I've heard. Yeah, I love my fancy yeah. dress, yeah. Being in Headingley, I don't know, if, have you done the Otley I've run? never done it, but I've got a lot of mates who've... Yeah, so you fancy dress, Otley run, end of season, you've got to do 18 pubs or bars and you have a pint in each and you just dress up, fancy dress and see how far you can go, so I've done it on a, quite a few occasions. Do you usually do that at the end of the season? Yeah, Like a fancy season, dress, yeah, yeah we, we've got our Mad Monday um, planning for after winning the grand final. So we can yeah. You think it run over by bus like Danny Cipriani on that, that time? No, no, no. No. Stay clear from that one. Stay clear. Um, uh, in terms of coming to an end, the career, um, and, and, you know, I don't want it to be too personal, having not only just met you and so on, it was a similar time when your, your marriage came to an end as well, mm -hmm. um, which I know that was a pretty dark moment for you. One, having to deal with not having the, the day job and something that you become so accustomed to from such a young age. It kind of all came at once, didn't it? Yeah, I, I retired 2017. After that, um, you know, went through divorce, met, met my girlfriend at the time. Um, it was, you know, I got asked by the Sun to do a sort of campaign, speak out, stay safe in mm. terms of mental illness. And I think Danny Rose had done it, mm -hmm. a number of footballers, I think some rugby league players had spoken out, a few cricketers, Steve Harmison, um, history, Marcus Trescothi spoke a lot about it. So it was just, yeah, I think you, you're with your mates, you get told what to do from, you know, 9.30 until um, whatever time, one o'clock when you finish training, then you play all day for the next day. And when you have that for 20 odd years and then it's all gone, there is that sense of, you know, self-esteem. How am I going to support my family? How am I going to pay my mortgage, the bills, the food, look after my two kids? So it all, yeah, of course I wasn't, I suppose I was in terms of mental illness, but yeah, I really struggle with the anxiety and what am I going to do? You know, mm. where's my career going to go now? What's my next option? Um, so yeah, in terms of that, yeah, it was quite quite scary, quite scary. And and I, I guess there was an ego thing there as well, even though you're not the kind of guy who comes across that who has an, e an ego, but when you played at that top level, you're suddenly not getting that. You're not getting that buzz. You can't get that adrenaline. You walk down the street every year that goes by, fewer, fewer people want a picture, recognise you, whatever, those things clearly play a part. Massively, massively. I mean, you know, again, you know, I know I've mentioned my dad quite a lot, but he, he said to me a number of years back, when you finish, you could probably count on one hand your friends that will stay in touch with you, that you'll that look after you, that you'll ring on a regular basis. And it's true, mm -hmm. really true. What are you down to? How many you got? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I can't, I can't count anyway, but... <laughs> Yeah, he, you know, he gave me great advice, but yeah, it, it was quite hard. You know, you, like you say, you sign autographs, everybody wants to kiss your backside. Oh, well done, you've had a great game. People offer you stuff, mm. you know, come and work for my business. But then when it's finished, it's almost like, well, he's finished now, that's it. Let's move on to the next one. Mm. It's like a conveyor belt. And you are in a way, as a sportsman, you, you are a piece of meat in a way. Yeah. And it was difficult to take, you know, not, not playing, not being around my teammates, not having that adrenaline rush, not playing in front of big crowds and not knowing, you know, what, you know, your earnings coming every month, at the end of the month, you know what you're going to spend on and not having that as well was really, yeah, it was really tough, mm. yeah, tough. It shows tough how feeling. fickle it is, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and again, like Wilkins says, we're all glorified entertainers. That's, sports is entertainment and that's, and that our role in that is to, to, is to perform. So as soon as the lights go out and you can't do it anymore, it's, it's, it's not like you can get another acting job or be in another film or musically do something else. It's just done. And it's something I think about, something that I'm probably quite wary of getting well, on a got, bit You've got this to come, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, it's that routine and that purpose in each day and losing that identity that I think is something that I've seen other players struggle with and something that I'm quite mindful of and hopefully trying to do other things to, to, to fill that void. But mm. yeah, just getting out of the bed in the morning, I imagine, is quite tough when you've not got that purpose or sch schedule to rely Yeah, I think it's like trying to, when I finished, I, w I was lucky in terms of, I got asked, would I go coach Surrey for the 2018 season for mm. their four day stuff? And then I got asked to do the skating. 
So I was quite lucky in that sense. But still, I had those mornings where, or weeks where I wasn't doing very much. I was like, what am I going to do today? Mm. What shall I do? You know, where's my self-worth or where's my focus? Where's my drive? You know, because you don't have to get up and go to the gym or, mm. you know, I'm playing a big game tomorrow. I need to, you know, make sure I, I see what they're, what the opposition players are doing. You don't have that anymore. So how do you, how do you replace that? Mm. Did you have any of those struggles while you were playing? Any mental struggles? No, none at all. No. None at all. All I came was, afterwards? All came afterwards. During my playing career, I was very lucky. I, I was quite driven in terms of, you know, I would make sure I did my homework on the opposition. I, I sort of knew my game inside out. I, I didn't really worry. You know, I, I realised that you're going to have bad games as a, as a player. You're not always going to have great games or play well. So I, I learned to deal with that. But when you finish, you, it's like, well, where is that now? Where is that? What do I replace that with? Because I know a lot of cricketers, and you mentioned Marcus Truscothy, but Marcus Truscothy, ones that come to mind, Jonathan Trott, um, had some some serious struggles. Obviously, well, whether whether that was a batsman thing, I don't know. Whether it, the batsman men mentality, but being on tour, being away from families, uh, can can have its struggles. I mean, you must have played with cricketers who who. We, we probably don't even know it wasn't even a high profile thing or what it didn't even they didn't want it to come out and, and had deep deep troubles yeah and I think it's nice it's nice that, that I had opportunity to just talk about how I felt and get it out there on you know the so, on the social media platforms in in the papers for people to just read it and know that you know even though we're sportsmen and people look maybe look up to us or you have your idols or heroes that at the end of the day, we are just human beings and we all have ups and downs and we're all part of, part of life. And I, I sort of struggled in terms of, yeah, wh what am I going to do? Mm. And I've seen players that probably wouldn't say they've struggled with mental illnesses, but, you know, they didn't like being away from home. You know, they'd miss the families dearly. You're in hotels on your own. Um, you know, you may feel as though you can't talk to your mates because you see it as, a, again, a macho... You know, oh, I don't want to tell my mates that I'm feeling down today. Oh, I'm really it's struggling. It's seen as a weakness, can't it? Yeah, and I guess it's, it can be seen as a weakness from the from the public as well. I certainly remember Truscothic and Trot uh, before. I guess we'd heard in depth what they were suffering from and what their particular issues were. The public's reactions: Look, you're in you're in Barbados, you're in the West Indies the whole exactly. of the summer. Get on with it. Look, you've got a great life. It's hardly a, a job, is it? Walking around in nope. your whites and so on. Yeah. It's easy to have that opinion, isn't it? Of course, so. and that may be rightly so. People will just see, well, you're playing for your country, you're touring the world, you get to stay in the nicest hotels, you're with your best friends, your families get to fly out with you. But for me, it isn't, it's about how that person feels inside and their struggles. It isn't about being on tour or being in a nice country. Mm. It's about that individual person and what battles they're probably going through. And appearances can be deceiving, can't they? I mean, you've seen it probably in Rugby League, Mark, as well. You see people, I mean, look, you've, <laughs> you've got one quite close to home at Salford recently. In terms of people that you see from the outside and they look well, the skin looks clear, everything looks fine, there's no red flags on the outside. But then you suddenly see something in the news and you're like, well, where the hell did that come from? Well, you have to, um, I think it's getting to know that person, especially in Rugby League, more so than, than more sports, is they do put up that facade that there's nothing going wrong and it's a macho male mentality that's, probably quite old and done now it's it's i know it's a generational thing but i think it, we need to kind of get away from that that point of view and we, sh we sh should share what's going on and stuff but um yeah i think you have to get under the skin of, of knowing someone and like like, like you alluded to then jansen turger who, who played with us who, who's had a few issues this year and um i was i wasn't that close to him but i got on pretty well with him but i i didn't know how much he was struggling until you know he went away and, and did what he did and um it is, it is quite sobering when you, when you learn afterwards that someone you, you, you're quite close with is, is going through such troubles and you, you, you can't be there to help them. Mm. It, I know there's so much emphasis in sport on rehab and physio and conditioning and so on, but there doesn't seem to be, well, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, um, much mindfulness and you've got an injury on your knee, we know exactly what to do. Pep will send you over to Barcelona, you'll, have, you'll see this surgeon, you'll have this rehab treatment, you'll be back in three months and so on. So if you've, if you've got an injury to your mind... Yeah, there, there, in rugby league, there is quite a few avenues is there? for players but to... More so, but more so what, in the last couple of years? Yeah, it? but it's mm -hmm. up to the player to kind of seek, seek help and talk. I don't think 
you can't put it on welfare officers 100% because they're there to be spoken to when needed. Mm. It's, it's up to people to kind of share what they're going through, first and foremost, I think. Yeah, I think you can't put it down to that, whether it's a psychologist, you can't just say, because you, you might not go up to them and, want, and speak to them, you might not be open and honest. Mm. So it is down to that person as well, but also I think maybe your teammates, you know, just to have a shoulder to cry on, you know. I think, again, we are seen as, you know, macho guys, oh, we can't, we can't tell, portray how we're feeling and it is a sign of weakness. But for me, your mates, you know, if you want to talk to your mates, your mates should be there for mm. you. But it is down to that person as well. Do you ever do anything like that? Do you ever do any meditating? Or? No, not at all, no. 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 Never, never got into mindfulness. No. I'm, it's interesting, with, we talked about Dr. Steve Peters. We had Damien Hughes on last week, um, sports psychologist and worked with many well, sporting idols and he's been sort of lauded by the likes of Tiger Woods and Sir Alex Ferguson and so on. But in terms of, uh, and Dr. Steve Peters came and worked with Liverpool and worked with British Cycling and so on, just wondering with the England cricket team as a, as a whole, ever had someone like that who would just focus on that side of the game? Yeah, you are. Now I think it is a huge part of the game and obviously it's been highlighted in, you know, with football and it's been on the front pages, hasn't it, mental illness. So mm. you have, you know, generally guys would be there with you on a regular basis. I think the England team do have one that follows them around. Yeah. I think York should probably do have one now that comes in on but a isn't regular that basis. That this has only just happened in the last sort of yeah. few years. When you mm -hmm. were you when you were on tour, when you were in that test team from two thousand and seven, whatever till well you had a good four years, didn't you, when you in your second time. That 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 didn't exist. No, I mean then you probably just say, everyone would just say, I'll oh, just what's up with you and get on with it. You know, mm. just crack on. Um, but now, you know, you it's there. You, I think a lot of players need it. I think because careers are so short, aren't they? Mm. You know, you're there in the public eye one minute, and you could it could be over within a blink of an eye. You know, you could be a 19-year-old brilliant player, you know, with a bright future, and then you could get a bad injury and never play again. And, and I guess where so, does that player, where does that 19-year-old go then? You know, yeah, has yeah. he just solely focused on his career mm -hmm. and not, you know, done something else to fall back on? And that's probably where sports men and women, you know, we are viewed as a bit of a commodity, but where do we go afterwards? You know, what, yeah. what can we... Well, no one cares, do they? And, and no. Right, there's, no, there's no aftercare. No, because there's, there's someone no else then. There's, yeah. a, there's another Ryan no, Seibottom yeah. or another We're Mark Flanagan. Maybe, you know, right? yeah. And that's the way probably managers, agents will think as well, commercial departments will think, social media will think as, uh, you know, you look at players now, and, and social media is a good topic, because we, we talked about this with Damien last, last week, when you were in your prime, um, in that England test side, Instagram wasn't a thing, Twitter was only just about starting and the trolls weren't even born at that stage, were they? That's, that's changed so much, so drastically now that when you look at players like Ben Stokes, who is just absolutely under the microscope more than anything, you guys probably got away with all sorts of things, all didn't sorts you? Of things, yeah, <laughs> massively. Also, I can't probably say what we, what we did get up to, but... I mean, yeah, the, I the now, pedalos were the least of... Uh, yeah, pedalos, I mean, that would be just... Everyone would just laugh with me now, <laughs> with a pedal up. Yeah, I think with social media, you know, you, you are there to be, I suppose, spat at, as it were, because, you know, if you have a bad game and you're on Twitter, mm. people that have the right to maybe have a go at you, I know it's not ideal, mm. but if you don't want to... If you don't want to do that, then don't go on social media because I suppose it's just the way of the world, isn't it, mm. now? Mm. I think Gareth Ellis, I read a piece on the train down saying that, you know, about the situation with Saints and the, the ref's decision and he's, he's on, the referee's on Twitter, isn't he? And, you know, I think he got a lot of abuse and I suppose it's just part and parcel of it. But you're there to be, had a go at if you're on social media and you have a bad game. You know, everybody wants to kiss your backside when you played well, but people want to drag you down as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, in terms of the things you did get away with, you've got my mind going there now. I mean, you, what was the... I know some things were out there. You, one of your games was credit card roulette. You used to play quite... Yeah, quite credit card well. roulette. You used How does to, that one work, Tell. So you would... You would throw all your credit cards in at the end. The bill might be... You might be out for a meal with your teammates and the bill might be 500 quid between you. You put your credit cards down, put a napkin over them, and then you get the waitress to, waiter or waitress to come over and pick them one by one. And the last one in would pay would pay the bill and I think Steve Harmison got it three times in a row I think his bill was like 1500 quid by the end of the week um, but it was a nice free meal being a Yorkshireman I love a you know you love a freebie don't you but I mean lots of things when I made my debut um, you know I was only I think 
17 or 18 and um, you know you travel with a senior player and I remember I was dying for the loo and he would just veer into the services and then drive straight through and then he'd go to the next one and I'd be crossing my legs busting for a number two and then he'd go through the next services and basically you know you'd turn up when you'd be you'd be absolutely dying for the toilet and he'd just be laughing his head off and I think the first night they got me drunk and I, I think I got a milk float back at 4.30 in the morning with one of the senior players and then the next night you sort of after the game you would have a team meal and they, I'd had three pints and I think I threw up on the scorer or something like that as well. So <laughs> On the scorer? Yeah, I think I'd had <laughs> mint choc chip ice cream. I was only 17 and you, you'd do the Royal Toast and you'd play a couple of drinking games and they'd pick on the young one and that was me and then lo and behold I threw up on the scorer and got into trouble. Everyone else thought it was hilarious but obviously at the time I didn't. So, so now these days are kind of behind you of getting into trouble and all those things. What, what is your release? I mean, go back to talking about mindfulness and so on. What do, what do mm -hmm. you have to... To, because you know, Mark, for example, always had his plan and his business plan of where he's going afterwards. And it's, for some people, it can be a seamless transition into the afterlife. But um, but for you, you seem a bit of a jack of all trades. You, you did your dancing on ice. You've been property developing. You've been ripping kitchens out. Mm -hmm. You've been doing all sorts, haven't you? Yeah. So in terms of what I'm doing now, it's quite sporadic. You know, I do a bit of TV, a little bit of radio, Q and A's, um, hosting, um, did the skating, but. Yeah, my, my number one love was um, property developing. Mm. You know, I just, in my spare time, in the winters, when I first started... I can see would, a TV show here already. Nah, not at all. You were just six months of the year. The rest of six months, it was like, off you go. You you fend for yourself, pretty yeah. much. But you could de we could do them up. Lawrence Llewellyn and Bowen, I can see this. Yeah. Dion Dublin does it, doesn't he? Dion Dublin, yeah. yeah. he does. What does he do? Oh, he Homes does under the hammer. Yeah. 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 You never yeah. thought about that? If that's your love, if that's your passion. Yeah, I think it was just, again, I always, I wanted something to get my teeth into, replace that adrenaline rush of not playing in the, in the summers. And I just, you know, I had a couple of friends that, you know, were joiners and builders. And I just, I used to go on the site with them, do a little bit of bricklaying, bit of labouring. Um, have that, you know, that team camaraderie with the boys, you know, sit and do a bit of brick lane and help them out. And that was sort of what I did for a few years just mm. to, you know, away from the game. And that, you know, I used to go to the gym as well and, and try and keep myself relatively fit, ready for the, for the following season. So you don't do any of that anymore, do you? You don't do any weights? It's all, it's all yoga based. I mean, I know towards the end of your career and this is a yoga. subject that's, that's come up. Yeah. 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 You're a yogi did, bear, aren't you? Yeah, I did a lot of yoga because I, I couldn't keep up with the training in terms of the running with the boys and you know they'd still do a lot of hill running a lot of weights and I still did the weights but for me I did a bit of yoga and a bit of Pilates just to sort of help with the fitness so I wasn't plodding the streets or you know doing hard stuff to the body mm. so I was ready to play basically I just used to turn up and bowl and bowl my overs and, and do my stuff. Mm. And, what, and that's all purely longevity and we've seen footballers do it haven't we the likes of Brad Friedel and Ryan Giggs and people who claim that they stuck another six years on their career. I mean, you retired at what, 40, 41? Yeah, I was tra just I'm 39, so I'd nearly turned nearly turn 40. Yeah. So yeah, it was just to look after the body and the legs and the knees. And that was, you know, again, a physio and a S&C decision that we, I would just tone it down in terms of running and, you know, weights, just to make sure I stayed, stayed fit and healthy for, for playing. Mm. I mean, I did look after myself, you know, I'm, I think, Mark, now you have your physios, don't you, masseuses, ice baths, and, you know, there's so much there for you, you know, to make sure you have a longer career. Mm -hmm. um, got to talk about the Ashes quickly. Yep. What's what's going on here? I mean, what, what a series. It's awesome, isn't it? Amazing, isn't it? You know, on you, the back of the World Cup. You never Cup. played an Ashes test, did you? No, unfortunately, you know, that's is that one, one, of you, is that one of you, Is that one of your big things you look back on? Yeah, that's the I one think, regret. Not, not, not regret, regret, but, yeah, I would have, you know, I was in the squads a couple of times, but I would have loved to play in an Ashes series. You mm. know, playing against Australia, there's no better feeling is than beating the Aussies. Um, but, yeah, I think this is a cracker, isn't it? You know, on mm. the back of the World Cup, you know, the Ashes has been absolutely brilliant. And then the game at Headingley, you know, I was there the first two days and England getting bowled out for 64. You wouldn't give them a cat and L's chance of coming mm. back in that game. But, you know, Ben Stokes, a national hero now that he is. And Knighthood? Well, I don't know. Prob I mean, that's again, isn't it? You know, we, we sort of, those type of players, you know, we, oh, Ben Stokes, what did he do? We did that you know, in, in the media about his punching and stuff like that. But now, you know, it's, it's the beauty of sport, isn't it? You know, from, from a hero to a, 
absolute hero, isn't he? He's definitely got sports personality hero. wrapped up on it. Yeah. yeah. That's a but isn't that amazing about this, this country and the society we live in is that you, we kind of, you know, after the incident that happened in Bristol, which... I mean, let's not put word, let's not go there really, but whatever happened in, in Bristol, where he's come from and what he's recovered from, yeah. to now be, oh, he's got to be knighted. He's got to, he's got to get a knighted. I mean, that's, is that not Britain all over? And isn't that this sort of tabloid generation that we live no, in? No, I don't, don't, don't think you judge someone by one act that we don't really know much about. You, you see his, his heroism, on the, his hero, heroic actions on the field and the way he handled that pressure and brought home two amazing results to the country, probably you take him at that rather than one incident where people don't really know much about it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, we all, you know, we've all been there. We've all made mistakes. Um, I think obviously just because media is so huge now in terms of what Sky and BT, you know, it, it's always going to be there. But I think you judge a player on what he does out on the on the field at the end of the day. And he he's a big player, isn't he? You know, yeah. when... When the teams needed him, he's sort of that player that, yep, yeah, I'm going to do it. I'll put my hand up and and win those big games. So mm. he, he's been absolutely awesome, hasn't he? And I think it, now the Ashes is finally balanced, which is great. Again, after the World Cup, is great for cricket. That it's one-one. There's two games to go. Which way is it going to go? Steve Smith's probably going to play this game and be back. So how's it going to how's it going to play out? You know, England have come back when. Probably Australia were on top, and I think Old Trafford's going to be a cracker, isn't it? You know, we all want to see what's going to happen. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? How do you get Steve Smith out? Uh, great to speak to you, Ryan. Thank, Thank you, you so much for Thanks coming. Thanks for having in. us on. Um, enjoy your time on the terraces at Bradford Bulls. Thank now, you. Now everyone officially knows you're a Bradford Bulls fan. Yeah. Yeah. A bit Jewsbury now, wasn't it? Now, now at Jewsbury, I've been yeah. Jewsbury, freezing cold. <laughs> you could have gone over to Toronto to see. You know, John Wilkin play against Bradford. Yeah, still course, a chance for that. We can maybe sort that yeah. out for you. Um, don't forget your Ryan side bottom hair advice. Don't mm. shampoo every day. Mm -mm. Um, use a conditioning oil. A bit of oil, mm -hmm. yeah. You said. Don't put oil. a hair dryer too no. hot. No, you never want to. Do you have a hair dryer? No. No hair dryer. No, no hair dryer. Do you use a hair dryer? Well? I do use a hair dryer every day. Probably too much. You tell yeah, it. Looks good. Um, any any like, styling tips from yourself? Concealer no, no. around the eyes. Oh, I need some concealer around the eyes, mate. Tinted moisturiser? No. Just a no? bit of Botox and get some plastic <laughs> surgery if you're feeling insecure. Mm -hmm. Good night.